elements, setting up our buffers, and actually setting up presets for our render settings. Render layers. Now the first thing I would like to do in terms of project creation. Now in production usually uh, these presets are actually either loaded by default or you actually have to load them manually from a particular preset library. But in this particular case we're going to assume that we're going to be creating this by ourselves. So render layers. In terms of render layers one of the things I like to do or that I've learned works very well for me especially if you're working in feature film is to be able to actually separate certain render layers that might prove troublesome as you go along when you start lighting your scene uh, obviously there are different ways to do this but one of the ways that I find that works very well for me and in production is setting up obviously a beauty layer now the beauty layer is where we have all our major AOVs, our our reflection, our lighting information, our diffuse, our basically all the elements that make up the beauty will actually be in that particular beauty. It's a layer on its own. Now the beauty layer usually, obviously, like I said, comes with all the extra stuff that you would need to actually recreate your beauty in comp if you have to recreate it. Now, what are the essential passes render elements that you will need? for a good recomposition of a beauty should in case if you have to recreate the beauty in comp before we go into that i would like to actually start bringing up the, the very few basic quick basic you know render elements that we will need as we actually start carrying our test because initial our initial stage is to actually test out our render element our render to see if things are working well obviously we need our diffuse if we're going to be checking our textures you can just shift select them and you can add them at once. We need our reflection, we also need our refraction, we need our sample rate, I need my self illum, I need my specularity, I need my lighting, I need my GI. Uh, one of the other things I also do is to actually include some of the raw light to actually see how noisy our lights are. I'm going to take my raw light, I'm also going to look for my raw GI. Uh, I'm going to look for my reflection filter my raw refraction and my reflection filter and I always like to see my Z depth and if I'm using displacement or bump I want to see my bump normals my normals as well uh, if I'm using subsurface scattering uh, so pretty much this, th these are the passes I like to actually start working with uh, I'm just gonna click add and that should actually add all those passes into our render element so here we go we've got all our passes that we've actually clicked um, like I said these are the ones I actually used to actually diagnose my scene to see what problems I'm having noisy reflections noisy GI noisy refractions or noisy spec channels so th that actually gives me you know a good a good starting point now that I've actually got the basis of my G of my beauty, obviously as we go along, there are custom beauty, uh, beauty render elements that I will add. For example, creating an occlusion. If you want to add the occlusion within your beauty, you can quickly use an extra te text and pipe in your V-ray dirt material into that to actually give you an AO within the buffer itself. But I have always liked to separate my AO into a different channel, the AO. As you can see here, I've got two AO, two ambient occlusion types. I've got my loose ambient occlusion. I've also got my tight ambient, ambient occlusion. Now, the loose uh, ambient occlusion gives me a broad occlusion, very, very soft fall off occlusion to actually give me a broad range. And the tight occlusion gives me a tighter occlusion around the edges. Now, in comp, those two occlusions would actually can be used creatively to create some interesting effect my shadow I'm talking about ground shadow uh, w if there's a sh if there's a floor plane and you like to cast shadow on certain places it's always good to separate your shadows obviously your shadows cannot live within the buffer itself atmosphere if you're creating any custom atmospheres fog etc uh, the last particular layer I have here I always like to say interactive reflection
Now and then you will have to create secondary ref reflection. If an object is moving past a particular object and it's meant to cast reflection, it's difficult to actually create that within the beauty buffer. So you might have to actually create interactive reflection or interactive light. So these are the basic project setups that I always have. Once I know I've got this setup, I know I'm good to go in terms of render elements, in terms of, you know, render passes. And the next thing I always like to go to is to go to my render globals and also check my, obviously check my commons tab, make sure I've got multi-channel AXR, uh, make sure I'm actually doing rendering linear workflow. I'm going to touch on linear workflow later on as we go along, but in order for you to quickly look at it, if you go to your color mapping section, I've got my gamma 2.2, I uh, do not affect colors adaptation only. Right now, this is what, this is the basics of it. I'm going to explain a bit more on how to, you know, set up linear workflow, how to color correct, gamma correct your textures as you load them on. But for now, we just stick to this particular uh, preset. Now, if I go to my preset section here, yeah, I've got two types of preset. I've got my production preset, where I've got my main and maximum samples. I've also, I've also got my settings 2.9. All these things I'm going to talk about as we go along. Right now, this is just like a preset. I've also got my test preset, which is pretty much the V-Ray default. Uh, this is where I do like my very, very first test, just to see the way things are looking. And if things are looking okay, I can slightly you know increase the sample and as, as I go along just to get better better results I also go to my global section I've got a 64-bit machine memory wise so I'm just gonna put 32 basically this this is half of my memory so if you've got like 16 gigs you just put 8 and that's it's just a rule of thumb and I've got my render region set to 32 default is 64 but the lower your render region, the better, you know, the, your render would actually go faster. Once again, I'm going to explain all this. This is just like a quick preset that I've that I've set up. As we go along, we, we actually go in detail into why some of these presets are chosen. As we begin to use them, you begin to see them real life, in real time, how they apply. So basically, that's that's all we're, we're talking about uh, in terms of project setup. The next thing we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking a bit more into asset preparation and see how we can actually examine our asset and prepare our asset for for lighting for our render presets. In this particular lesson, we're going to be looking at asset preparation. Now, this is one of the most fundamental, important aspects in production. As a lighter in production, when I get an asset, I assume that the asset is ready to go. The asset is modeled to scale. Or to production scale or it's shaded and everything is good to go now this particular asset we're going to be working on is the uh, digital tutors transforming robot uh, although we're not going to be seeing the transformation we're just going to be looking at rendering one frame using feature film techniques to light this particular robot and we're going to be using V-Ray obviously um, one thing I normally do is that when I get an asset is to check the first thing I check is the UVs now I check the UVs for a reason because 90% of the problems that are gonna happen are gonna happen with the textures the shader is easy to fix it's either based on reflection or based on refraction or based on transparency or translucency now the textures is a different story the textures are always use are usually painfully painted to fit a particular UV layout now if that UV layout is wrong that would actually affect the final outcome of of the way the asset will look like so UV tiles uh, one thing I've also done is to create a custom shelf uh, basically I've actually placed most of the uh, tools I'm going to be using uh, pretty much throughout this this course and it's easy for, for you to do if you just select a particular uh, tool and click Control shift it should appear on the shelf I've named my shelf cliff I'm just gonna go quickly go to my UV editor I'm gonna click the as just uh, marquee select my asset and the first thing I'm gonna notice is that I've got a UV tile and this UV tile actually goes from 0 to 
one two three four five six one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and that tells you a lot that this is this is how this particular asset is laid out and i assume that also this asset has actually been taken to marry and custom textures have actually be, been painted as a light type, this gives you an idea of what to do because you need to know how to load your textures you need to know how to load your textures because if you assume that that everything is zero to one space without checking your uvs and you're actually t text loading your textures or shading and you've forgotten that there's a lot more texture to go around in the uv tile section then things are going to look really really bad and looking at this uv tile begs another question obviously there's two ways to tackle this particular uv tile section either using layer textures or using a udim variable we're going to be talking about udim variable as we go along so my uvs are good this asset has been in production so it's good to go it's pretty much green lit um so my, now that my now that i've looked at my asset and i'm happy with my asset the way things are uh one thing i normally tend to do now is to actually just do a quick quick overview of what kind of lighting i'm going to be using for this particular asset how am i going to tackle the lighting since this is a feature film tutorial uh one thing i normally like to do at this particular stage is to light to a rough broad stroke lighting of my gray shaded asset now it gives me an idea of where things are the silhouette of my asset without worrying about loading high res textures i just want to see where my my asset is at in terms of lighting now as you can see i've created a light here a top light i've also created a side light now uh, i've also got an hdri a dome light in here now obviously i'm not going to i'm not going to go into detail of how to uh, to create a dome light or how to pipe in your your texture into your dome light uh that that's very 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 basic if you're new to v-ray or you need to do you just go to uh, the use dome texture section and you can actually pipe in your hdri via that port now the next thing we're going to do is to now just do a quick first thing i'm going to do is just kill or disable the lights i'm just going to click disable all the lights and just leave the dome light i'm going to quickly run to my outliner just grab it here as you can see we've got a few lights we've been testing stick my dome light here so right now we've only got we're going to be lighting this scene via our dome light information so i'm just going to quickly click render so, so here's our render with just one dome light with a basic hdri as you can see things are pretty pretty flat it's uninteresting it's just uniformly lit so this just gives me an idea of the kind of you know things i'm going to be looking for i mean how will i how am i going to design the lighting just based off of what i'm seeing i need hard rim light i need a top rim i need a side rim do i need a front rim or do i need a fill light what do i need looking at the silhouette and the sharp edges of of our asset it's a metallic in nature that suggests hard lighting in order to catch the broad specular uh contour of our particular asset if this were purely organic it will be lit differently but in my experience when you're lighting mechanical assets cars robots you need really you need to rim it very well you need to add complex rim lights and a accent lights to actually help you accentuate the contour and the silhouette of the particular robot if you light it flatly if you light it without bearing in mind the contour of the robot you're going to get some really nasty results so what I'm going to do now is just quickly send this to our render view. And um, I'm just going to quickly hide those two panels. The next thing I'm going to do is to just quickly enable my top light. This is my top rim light. And I'm just going to do another render. So here we go. This is our top rim light. I'm just going to quickly go back to our old render. Save that render. And I'm going to send that to our render view. So as you can see, this is our straight up dome light. It looks boring, it's flat. 
but as, as soon as as soon as we add a top rim light we're looking at something quite interesting already so basically we can see that we're rimming it from the top we're getting some nice rim here and this is just like the gray shaded no specularity no reflection we're just trying to paint a picture with light how can we make this asset interesting how can we push it carefully placing our light especially in future film where it's all about drama and entertainment you need to think outside the box so now that we've actually done that I'm just gonna quickly add uh, one more light just quickly enable this light and I'm just gonna go back to my bookmark and just get that there so let's now light this particular let's let's light this with the one additional this is our key light obviously and that's our top rim light and we've got our dome light so I'm just gonna quickly render that so this is our third light we've just added a key light from here as you can see already we're getting something really interesting uh, let me quickly save our previous render and I'm just gonna quickly send this to our render render view so this is our first render with a straight up dome light like I said looking at it this way you're beginning to understand some of the problems we're running into we've got our second light with a top rim light and we've got a directional rim light as you can see it's it's already looking interesting without even adding any shaders just using light to paint colors in the next lesson we're going to be taking this for then actually looking at you know setting up textures looking at UDEM, looking at options to actually respond to lighting in this particular lesson we're going to be looking at texture preparation we're going to be looking at UDIMs we're also going to be looking at layered texturing now the first thing we need to do if you remember in the last lesson we looked at our UVs I'm just going to quickly load my UV editor as you can see we talked about how our UVs are laid out in unique shells now I know beforehand that this particular texture the texture that came with this robot was painted in Mari so obviously every single shell corresponds to a particular numbering now there are two ways to do this to line this up in Maya you can use the old layer texture technique or you can use the newer UDIM based technique whereby each particular shell has a unique numbering and that variable actually arranges the texture in a particular shell for you you don't have to worry about you know layering and offsetting textures so without further ado how do we load multi-tile textures in Maya and how does V-Ray interpret those multi-tile textures and what are the problems we will face if we use a layer texture method or if we use a UDEM method I'm just going to quickly load my hypershade. Now, before we go on, go on to go on to the UDEM section, I'm just going to quickly load the original texture that came with this particular asset. Uh, one of the things you will notice is that these are all the textures that actually came with the asset. And this is our master shader here and everything is actually laid out this is our layer texture this is all our diffuse information as you can see these are all the uh, layer textures that's the diffuse and this section here is actually our specular section and it is quite hard and laborious to actually lay this out manually thinking about the offset of each particular texture if I should quickly go into one of the textures and go to the placement texture you can see that there's an offset in a translate frame section you have to do it for each particular texture and that takes time and this method obviously while laborious can also break at times it's difficult to figure out which particular offset or which particular translation in the uh, placement UV tile texture which particular section is broken so this method obviously it's not efficient for us the UDIM variable actually works way way better in that all we need to do is to just get the variable into that layer that into the multiple textures and it actually load it up for us now how do we do the multi put 
multiple UDIM uh, methodology. Let me quickly go to the hyper shade again and I'm going to quickly load my shader. Now you can see compare this particular shader to the previous one I showed, showed you. This is our diffuse and this is our spec. In the previous one our, we had like quite a lot but t more than 10 textures actually laying up. This is quite clean and neat. The question is how do we load a UDIM texture type numbering into Maya? I'm going to quickly click my texture here. And let's go back to our file menu. As you can see there's a UDIM variable here. Um, as you can see, like I said, there's a UDIM variable here. If we quickly go to the folder where we've loaded our texture, let me actually quickly copy the path first. Just gonna quickly copy that, and I'm just gonna quickly paste it so that we can see what file directory. As you can see, we've got quite a lot of textures here. We've got more than 10 actually almost 20 textures here pretty much imagine laying this out manually it it will be quite frustrating especially if, if you new to that process and nothing is working and the textures some of the sections are coming out black which has happened before so all you need to do is to click one of the textures as you can see they're all different all laid out in different places click one of the textures this is our diffuse texture for example the unique thing we need to understand is that in order for your UDM variable to work is that whatever naming you have here. For example, I've got diffuse underscore. If you got diffuse dot or diffuse dash or whatever you have, whatever comes after the name of the te of, of, of your texture, make sure that's what you put in the variable. Diffuse underscore is the name of the type of the channel. And that's what that variable will look for it will look for diffuse underscore and when it finds diffuse underscore it adds the number in that corresponds to that particular tile that's why here I've got if we quickly go to our diffuse section I've got diffuse underscore if I change this to diffuse dot or diffuse anything other than diffuse underscore the UDIM variable will break so as long as you know what this name is if you have no underscore here whatever the name of your channel is for Mari just put that channel if it's diffuse put diffuse if it's diffuse dot put diffuse dot if it's diffuse underscore put diffuse underscore in this particular case it's diffuse underscore and you them capital letters in between the greater and lesser than sign dot the file name extension that's all you need to do that automatically loads every single every single texture into its unique numbering shell corresponding to the UV tile that you've actually created and that's really fast now the same thing hap applies to our specular channel as well if we quickly go to our specular channel I need to quickly pipe in my uh, channel again Let me go to maps we've also got our specular same thing so as long as we know what that is spec underscore as long as you have your spec underscore whatever that name is that's the you need to put you need to put in and that's all you need to do when you load that texture it will sh Maya will bring out an error warning saying that it cannot you know create this uh, create that for viewport view or something like that it will always throw up a warning of, of some kind and it always comes out black but don't worry the texture is actually loaded. And the next thing you need to do is to just select your asset and assign your material to the asset. And pretty much that's all we need to do. And we've actually loaded loaded up more than almost 30 textures in five minutes. If you had to do that the old method, the layer texture method that will definitely you know pretty much take a very long time to actually load all those textures and load all the translate frame which will really take a while to, to to figure out if something breaks you really don't know what's broken so pretty much that's that's all we're doing for texture preparation i talked about linear workflow 
um, uh, briefly. I said we're going to be talking more about that. Uh, in terms of UDIMS, if you want to add your texture, uh, you add your texture input gamma the same way you add a normal texture. So V-Ray texture input gamma that actually correct color correct all the texture input. Uh, co sorry, co color correct all the gamma for you for all the textures in one button. In the other method, you have to actually manually set the input gamma for every single 26 textures that you have, and that will take a long time. If you have diffuse, multiply that by 26. If you had spec, multiply that by that. If you have reflection, so the more textures you have, the more work you have to do. But with the UDIM section, you can actually do everything in one fair, easy clean cut process so our te texture input gamma can be added on all textures in one go and that, that's that's the beauty of uh of using this particular method so it's essential to actually understand how this works so at textures in this particular lesson we're going to be looking at image based lighting now for those of you who are familiar with hdris hdris are the bread and butter of the film industry in order for you to actually accurately light particular scenes, visual effect scenes that match a particular real life practical plate, you actually need a HDRI information. The HDRI basically is different exposures with different angles stitched together with an application like PT GUI, and that's actually loaded into your scene using a dome light, a sphere light, once again, depending on what particular software you're using. In this particular case, since we're using V-Ray, image-based lighting, the, the process of image-based lighting is actually also, like I said, unique, not just to V-Ray, but to other softwares. You, you have the IBL in Mentor Ray, and you've got the Skylight in, uh, in Arnold. So how do we go about setting up image-based lighting in V-Ray? Now, for those of you who have done this course before and you know exactly what that is, you can actually skip this lesson. But for those of you who are still learning V-Ray, uh, especially in terms of feature film, this would actually help you out a lot. Now, to create a dome light, uh, just go to create light dome light. You could just create your dome light. I've actually gone ahead and created a dome light. Uh, this is my dome light. Now, this is what you get when you create a dome light. You actually get this particular uh, curve curvature, which looks a bit different. Now, the dome light, characteristics of the dome light is quite unique to any other V-Ray light. It's pretty much quite similar. Uh, obviously, on the basic parameters section, you, you've got your enable function that actually enables and disables your V-Ray light automatically. You've got your color mode. Uh, once again, you've got your color and your temperature. Now, depend, depending on how accurate you want your lighting to be, uh, you have to also be careful because once you click temperature, it disables your light color. You can control your temperature by actually piping in the values that you want. You can use the slide bar and that changes accordingly to what temperature. You can go to warmer temperature and you can also go to or a lot more cool uh, warmer temperature pardon me and you can go to cooler temperatures uh, so you, you also got your intensity multiplier uh, this actually multiplies all the values you've put in to, uh, to to a set value the default is always one and um, that's independent of the temperature the temperature value is just a temperature value so I'm gonna switch that back to color now you've got your spherical dome. The spherical dome is a quite it's quite a good feature in that you can actually separate both hemisphere of your dome. Uh, if this is the top hemisphere. When you actually click spherical dome, it actually completes the whole the whole the whole sphere. So that way you can actually create effects. For example, if you don't want a lot of light coming from underneath below the surface, you can actually say, "I just want it to be." one particular half of the sphere of my dome light and you can just create a ground plane 
and just back create a bounce light effect by using a ground plane there's so many ways you can actually use use this and in feature film especially for those studios that use v-ray uh this th th there's so many things you can do with this it's just so many things as we go along in more advanced lessons i'm going to be showing you guys different techniques that you can that you can use one of the techniques that i tend to use also to control both hemispheres to create two different light domes for example i'm just going to quickly duplicate this i'm going to flip it upside down in 360. Oh, sorry sorry about that the duplicate function did not work i'm going to create another light another dome light and uh, this particular dome light let me quickly go to my outline it might be easy for us to actually see what we're doing so i've got two dome lights i've got my first dome light i'm gonna call my that first dome light this is my northern sphere and this is my southern sphere so what i'm gonna do to my southern sphere is to rotate it completely upside down in 360. I think that's why rotation so I'm just gonna say let's say 180 to start with yeah 180 I'm gonna select both lights this is my northern sphere and this is my southern sphere and both lights are actually you know pretty much you know in the same place but what I'm gonna do that is unique to this to my southern sphere is that I'm gonna lay load the exact same HDRI so I'm just gonna go to my attribute editor and quickly load to load the HDRI you just use use texture dome and just pipe into where you've saved your HDRI and I'm gonna be using like I said I'm gonna I'm gonna be using the same HDRI to actually you know create this effect this is a favorite if effect of mine that I use now and then so now now that I've actually piped in my texture I'm gonna go back to my outliner and click my spherical dome. Now the first thing you'll notice is that our HDRI looks as if it's upside down, but it's not. If I click my spherical dome, we get a complete HDRI. But I'm just gonna quickly, you know, move that around. You can rotate that. And you can actually rotate that one of the things you can also do is that now that we've this is our HDRI you can also flip our HDRI here if we go go to our texture here and go to our vertical orientation you can actually use transforms basically the transform actually corrects if you leave the transform as default it will always default up but if you use transform it's going to follow the transformations of our dome so if i click our sudden our sudden dome just click both actually i need to disable transforms on this particular one i'm going to click that one So I'm gonna go. So this is this is the one facing the right way up, and this is the one that's facing the other way. So I'm just gonna click uh, use transforms on that one. So I'm gonna click both lights. So as you can see, the trees are exactly in. If I should just line those two trees up, so basically we've get we've got a full spherical dome, but with two different hemispheres. Now the whole idea is I can take this particular hemisphere and just click both and I, I can actually say I want this to just be reflection alone I could just bring down my reflection contribution I don't want there to be reflection from the ground but on my main dome I want there to be reflection I want there to be diffuse so I can light my scene creatively I can actually bring the intensity of my bottom dome i could make that to be temperature make it warmer at the bottom and cooler at the top 
So these are two various creative ways in which you can actually, you know, set up a dome. For feature film, basically drama, like I said, is the ens essence of the day. You know, the way you create your, your light, you know, determines what your asset will look like. In the next few lessons, we're going to be actually doing some tests with uh, a few more dome light techniques. Basically, I'll show you guys a few more things about uh, how HD.